Okay, we're here with Bill Ottman, founder of Minds. And did you find fund that yourself, or did you have partners with that, or tell uh, us about friends and family? But uh -huh. yeah, I mean, I, I was definitely one of the initial pushes, and then friends and family, and we're we're sort of scheming crowdfunding now, and what we're gonna do to take things to the next level. Yeah, how long have you been at it? Let's see. Well, we launched the mobile apps in June of last year, which was our first bigger scale launch. But we've been around for a few years just kind of doing viral media and, and working behind the scenes on the tech. But, yeah. You know, we sort of lay low because we wanted to make sure it was scalable when we launched. Yeah. So tell us so tell us the long-term vision for what you see this. Because I mean, we had a great conversation last time. You were talking about all kinds of things, like including open source payment mechanisms, distributed payment mechanisms, and so forth right. with Minds. Go ahead. Yeah, so ultimately, I don't see... I feel like it's inevitable that there will be an open source social network that they climb to, you know, at least in the top 100 or top 10, ideally, sites on the planet. So right now, the only open source organization in the top 10 is Wikipedia, obviously an unbelievable organization. They disrupted all of the proprietary encyclopedias for, for good reason. And um, the only other in the top 100 who are open source are Reddit and WordPress, both great companies. Um, but nothing really in the full-blown social networking space has made, it, has made it up yet. So, but a lot of people say, oh, you know, what's going to be the next Facebook? But really, it's not going to be anything like Facebook because it's not going to be totally centralized. Like there, there could be a central hub, and ideally there will be a central hub that rises above Google and Facebook um, to the top slot. But that will most likely be a decentralized network of networks. So what we just released is uh, a platform to start your own social network and mobile apps. And what we want to do is create thousands and thousands of social networks and then have them optionally be able to intercommunicate, federate, and, you know, share however however they see fit. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's kind of the basic plan. Yeah. Um, Questions, but Jonathan? There's many other, there are many other great distributed social networking projects out there, and I think that there are great opportunities to build bridges between them all. So you have um, play, you know, projects like ZeroNet and Diaspora and some mm -hmm. other really cool initiatives. Some of them have slowed down, some of them are gaining steam, some of them are in really early phases. We, you know, in, in terms of the usability from the front end perspective, I think we're pretty advanced, mm -hmm. um, more advanced though yeah. than, than many others. Um, and we're also on really modern software frameworks that, of, so that's a, that's a positive. Um, are you in active contact with with those groups, or are you collaborating? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, it, we just open sourced all the code on August fifth, so we're you know starting all those communications now to get plugins going and cross posting, so that you can cross post from you know mines to other distributed social networks and you know in and out between each other. Um, and then yeah, there's there's lots of plugins that we want to build. Yeah. Tell us um, briefly why you think that the distributed or decentralized distributed network will be the dominant force because I remember we talked about it last time. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I like to, when I write decentralized, I like to put the D, E in parentheses because I think it's both. I mean, part of the reason I don't think distributed social networks have taken off yet is because Sometimes you'll go to some of these sites and you don't even know what to do. People are like, wait a second, I have to start my own node and like run a server and stuff. And for the vast majority of humanity, that's just not going to happen. Mm. No one's going to no one's gonna do that. So you, you need it to feel kind of like Google and Facebook from the initial experience. Yeah. And then, you know, you make, it, you make a page, it feels like everything else. But then you see these little cues that say, hey, you know, all of this code can be yours. You can start your entire own app and social network on it, your own website, own domain name, everything. Mm -hmm. You can customize the code. And then, so you get them in that way, and then you start planting seeds to, to show what the 
larger mission is. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, pretty good. You know, hopefully we can uh, get a bunch of developers uh, collaborating. We've already got a great, great team. Really excited to work with you guys to, to get some stuff rocking. Yeah, no, that sounds great. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. what, um, how do you feel it sort of integrates into your whole uh, starter kit concept? Well, as far as a social network, open source social network, so we own our data and our and our posts don't vanish. That's simply one of the tools that we will use. I mean, uh, basically, if we talk about the open source economy, the infrastructure has to include everything. So that's social networks and whatever. And down the road, so we, we mentioned last time we talked about the open source version of Google Docs or cloud co collaborative infrastructure. So that would be very, very interesting. Um, in fact, on our 20-year roadmap, we have the open source Google Maps, Google Docs in there as one of the distinct milestones because it's something that's critical to, to collaborative development and definitely not, it's not good the way it is right now where that's completely centralized in terms of, you know, in terms of Google going down, I mean, we'll be, we'll lose a lot of content, you know, things like that. Sure. You know, it's very interesting to think about because Google's very aware of this whole schism between proprietary and open source mm -hmm. development, and they roll things out open source only when it's strategic for them. Right. So they they know that on lower levels or bit more base levels of the infrastructure, like for instance with Angular or with Android or with you know more like server tools that they do contribute to open source in, in, in actually a significant way, but the mm -hmm. vast majority of Google and Facebook are all proprietary, and right. they're doing that so intentionally, um, which is frustrating because, you know, they're, they're kind of forcing the open source community to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Because Google Docs is brilliantly designed. It works great. I mean, we're sitting on Google Hangouts right now. Exactly. Like, this software is so nice but yet they won't share it with us They'll right share it with us and let us use it but they're forcing us to say oh we have to build an open source version of google docs we have to build open source social network we have to do all these things again when if they would just you know contribute to the comments i think that it would actually ice their position as leader in the world if they did that it would automatically make them number one forever wow well said. Yeah. yeah I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that, that. That There's huge social capital and practical power to doing that. So along with the cloud, cloud collaborative docs, we also want to talk about open source PayPal. And we touched on that last, last time. And then other things like cloud collaborative CAD. So if we can start rolling things, I don't know if you plan, what elements you plan on in Minds, but if Minds could be, a social network is something that everybody understands, and if around that we can build an entire infrastructure of other tools, or just collaborate that it's so plug and play that you have a complete interoperable ecology of these tools, that's, that's what we're after, and hopefully teaming up with Minds would be a great way to start that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny when you watch all of these social networks and how they're evolving now, because mm -hmm. essentially all the major networks in the world are social networks. So Google, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, I mean, and they're all right. copying each other's features. They're cloning each other's features. Uh -huh. It's all, all just sort of a race functionality at, at a certain point. So, yeah, I mean, if we can become sort of a a framework to, to plug in all of those different tools like that is certainly our goal. Yeah. Um, in, ter in terms of the economic stuff, we so we have a digital currency on Minds um, now that, so basically you earn, you're rewarded for getting votes, you're rewarded for activity, and you can exchange those uh, points for views mm -hmm. on your content. So yep. one point equals one view, and so if you earn a thousand points, you get a thousand views on your video or your photo or, or whatever you want. Um, we're also really, you know, eager to get into cryptocurrency and integrating that with, so that users can just exchange any type of currency they want. 
Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of the whole open source PayPal idea, um, you know, the funny thing about that is that, I I mean, that is certainly a project that needs to happen. uh, But PayPal is a centralized solution. There's a lot of legal work necessary to get all the regulatory stuff required to be handling all that liability and transaction volume and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it, it has to happen. It would be great to have an open source competitor to PayPal. But in the meantime, cryptocurrencies can help us achieve that more distributed yeah. uh, economy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> source everything man open source you know, I everything think, i think uh there's one idea that i found resonates pretty well with people like i don't know if we talked about this last time we were we were on a call but kind of how organic was into popular culture right. sort of in the last 10 15 years right and i think the same thing is is definitely happening with open source mm-hmm. and we, mm-hmm. we just have to keep hitting at home and it, yeah it's, it's kind of going to start sticking more you know i really try to emphasize in some talks that i do about how you know people now understand vote with your dollars you know invest in stuff that is sourced well and you know with your food whatever (laughs) it is you're buying whatever material so if we can expand that into the web and say look every time you open your browser every time you log into a social network every all those micro actions are empowering massive corporations so that in terms of voting with your energy and who, like what browser you're using what operating system you're using um, you know these things make a huge difference in terms of transferring power yeah yeah absolutely um, interesting the, the relationship between sound sourcing for material goods and then in the computer world that's that's open sourcing yeah I'd say that the MakerBot thing, um, the closure of, of the 3D printer world by MakerBot, I think that really sticks in people's minds since about 2012, 2012 or 2013 through 2016, I believe are the dark ages of open source hardware. Uh, I think a lot of people are influenced by that, whether they know it or not. Um, basically, the message out there, the common knowledge is open hardware doesn't work and that's kind of the the whole business world is operating under that assumption and um, including interestingly last I, t- I just talked to the founder of we share and, and he said that he thinks that we shouldn't be radical about open source you have to be pragmatic so-called right well <laughs> not someone's got to do it we got to create a, a viable alternative that's complete mm-hmm Someone has to do it. That's what it comes down to. I, you know, if you, when you watch talks from guys like Richard Stallman, you know, they get into this rift between convenience and freedom, mm-hmm. and you know, <laughs> access. So that that's the big that's the big thing. I mean, are you gonna are you gonna sacrifice convenience? It, it's there's lag time. So open source is just because there's less funding going into it in in the past we're sort of trying to catch up to the proprietary world but i mean i feel like there are many metrics that you know open source software and hardware worlds are are growing the markets are growing fast yeah sure yeah yeah i mean we're absolutely convinced that that's the next economy it's just there's a little lag time before the rest of the world world catches up yeah, it's about efficiency. I mean, I, I, t- I talk in a in framework of efficiency. A lot of people say, oh, this open source thing. Well, no, it's about efficiency at the core of open source. And if the business world is going towards efficiency, the natural default endpoint is the open source economy. So that's that's I just take that for granted. Right, and then your actual business value should be what makes your business successful it shouldn't be by keeping secret some blueprints right. it should be that your you know business is actually a good business that people right. want exactly um, yeah 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that all the signs are in good direction. They're actually even you know, on one side of the spectrum. There's more money from the venture capital world even going into open source than ever before. And I understand there's sort of a gray area with with all of that, but if you look at huge software projects like MongoDB, um, I don't know, Red Hat, I mean, oh, MongoDB is an open source database that is a multi-billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. So, and there's dozens of those who are starting to understand, that, and they're still playing with proprietary a little bit, like for WordPress, for instance, WordPress is all free and open source, but they've ma- created a business model where they will sublicense in like a VIP service, um, in um, and allow people to create proprietary extensions mm-hmm. on their product. Which you know what? I honestly don't think I really have a problem with that, as long as their core product is out there, open source, and they're continuing to support that. I think that it's it's. Oh, I mean, WordPress is such a gift for for the internet. I mean, 25% of the internet runs on WordPress. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Um, and actually, I want to do a, we're, we're working on a plugin for WordPress so you can inject mines underneath WordPress so that anyone who has a WordPress site, you can still keep that, but then there'll be a little login so that you can then go into your whole social network behind yeah. WordPress. And, you know, that, that would be a great collaboration to do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of yeah, lots of stuff. What's uh, what's your guys' biggest focus for the next month or two? It's uh, the builds coming up in November, so that's the that's the biggest part. So the the seed eco home and the aquaponic greenhouse, those are coming up. The kind of the the big builds. We we've got a lot of people signing up for those workshops. So that's in, coming up in November, but that's kind of where we're at here after the kickstarter which was majorly successful we got 116k it was good out of the 80 80k goal um so we got funded and then now just proceeding on the delivery yeah right. i was going to ask you so for for the social network should we make it at open building institute or open source ecology or should, should i talk oh, to katarina about that both? i mean mm-hmm. I, 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 would, I meant to ask you more about sort of the what is the relationship between those two entities? Yeah, so independent projects where open source ecology is pretty much providing the the machines to do the building with. Open Building Institute is focusing on a, on a housing aspect, which is one of the applications of the Global Village construction set, but very much aligned in terms of the, the goals. Uh, kind of basically spending my energy right now to support open building institute so so that its goals are accomplished and that people understand housing they don't understand tractors why do we need a tractor but they understand what a what a house is so that's a it's a good application good uh focus for us right now to go in that direction but but as far as the organization either independent projects but katrina is my wife so so we live here and we dog food this uh the whole I mean, we're pretty much, yeah, life, lifestyle investors. We're, we're living it and testing out whether this stuff is working, you know. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, I think we can, it's no big deal. We, we can put one up for each. Are they different teams with each, or is it all kind of one big team? It's kind of like we're all moving in unison right now, you can say, uh, since, since OBI is a startup, so that's just newly created project, whereas OSC has been around for a few years. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I, let's we'll start off with the open, one for Open Building Institute. We'll see yeah. how that goes, and yeah. then, um, you know, because you you can actually fragment yourselves more than you might. I mean, that is the interesting thing. Until we get the federation between networks working, so you can like optionally sort of share data. Um, mm-hmm. The in, the social networks are actually independent and private. Mm-hmm. So you know. That becomes, you don't want a hundred different social networks that you have to go to. You kind of right. want to have a streamlined, unified experience. Right. So we're working on those things like, uh, you know, common logins. You can use the same creds for all of them and so that mm-hmm. you can kind of have them interoperating. Uh, however, um, there's another interesting issue between, like, the database structure on all the top networks 
Google, Facebook, Twitter, everything. They're using usually centralized databases like uh, Cassandra and NoSQL as opposed to MySQL. And, but then you have the whole decentralized world, which is like BitTorrent style, where mm-hmm. everything is seeded everywhere and all of the machines are sort of meshing to drive the bigger organism. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's interesting use cases for both of those because you know some people want control of their data so that they can delete it and then if they delete it it's gone so on more Cassandra mine's currently is on Cassandra which is super scalable um, we are decentralized in the fact that anyone can set up a node and we're going to make them communicate but from more of a uh, stack perspective, it is quote unquote a centralized database. So we're going to also be working on um, an extension to do more of a BitTorrent style for your data if you want. But you know, it's just interesting that it works both ways. In some cases, you may want to publish something and just have it go out into the universe and just no control, totally uncensorable. Uh, sometimes, other times, you might not want to do that. Because, but you know, I would probably weigh more towards that long term. But you know, there are other times when you might want to be able to delete your stuff. It, so um, that's mm-hmm. sort of an interesting issue as well. Because when a lot of people in the decentralized open source social networking world will be all about make everything totally uncensorable, and I obviously support that. Like I'm a freedom of speech nut, but. Uh, you have to be careful what you wish for sometimes, <laughs> because if it, yeah. if, if it's all uncensorable, that you have to be, you have to know that everything you're typing, everything that you're publishing, is out into the universe forever, and you can't take it down. Um, so, I'm curious uh, your your thoughts on that. Yeah, personally, I, I don't mind that. Uh, what's the, I mean, what's the negative? Like, you know, in an what's ideal like world, is there any? to like, well, controlling your data is sort of a paradox because if you really control it, you would think that you would be able to delete it and you would be able to move it and take it from wherever you want. If you created that data, okay, then, you know, you should be able to control it. And that's, but then there's another sense of control that says, um, I mean, the, the whole idea of the commons and public domain sort of is that we're all collaborating and our ideas are brainchilds of each other's ideas and we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and we're all just evolving together. That's kind of how I see things working more in reality. But, um, you know, there is a data privacy and security. Depending on where your head's at would dictate how you approach that problem. Um, what would be an example of, I mean, it's cause the decision has to be made. Okay. As long as you made it public, you, you know, you agreed that this is out of your control, right? That's what we, yeah, that's how we have it set up on minds pretty much now. I mean, you can delete stuff, but I mean, if you post something, someone could easily share it or grab the image. And you know, that was the decision that you made to, right, to put right. it out there. So we sure. can't just go policing the web and like, you know, if something gets out there, that can't be our responsibility to go take it down. And that's why it's funny to hear about these issues with Google, like the right to be forgotten or whatever. And that is, it seems a little bit unrealistic. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you let it out, the cat's out of the bag. It's like, it's practically not feasible to take it back. Right. Uh, but so you're saying, let's see. So is Cassandra closed source? So you no, use Cassandra's totally, C- 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 Cassandra's run by a- Apache. Okay. Um, and it's the, it's totally open source. A- everything in our stack is open source. Okay. Um, okay. So I thought it, because they it, were using that, the big ones, the big boys were using that. I thought they were using proprietary, but no. Hey, the big boys use GNU Linux too. So uh, they, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> they of are, course. They take the tools and then uh, don't share the work that they do. Exactly. No, that's right. Well, give- well, given the fact that it's a social network, there's always going to be that social component to where personal stuff gets out on out there, and like you said, being able to manage it and put certain boundaries and limitations so that it doesn't become abusive. And I think that's you know understanding exploitation and understanding where something can be very harmful. And I think that's the concern about, like you said, the database management either being centralized or more of a bit torn style. And I think that's given the social dynamics, understanding that component and how it affects relationships. I think some of the concerns that people have beyond just the technological 
sure. yeah. the whole idea of ownership, data ownership, becomes interesting. As I, I was checking out the wiki for, you know, how OBI and OSC operate in terms of, you know, the information that we're sharing each other here now is obviously all for the greater project, and there's like nothing proprietary that we're talking about. Um, it's Whoa. sorry. You did mention something about fragmentation, which I thought was pretty interesting, you know, that you, you actually framed that, because, again, like you said, you could have it so separated and people really won't know anything about it, so I think that's a really great perspective as well, that, you know, want to be able to basically grow that network and then begin the cluster or, you know, bring other people together in terms of a federation network. Yes, you know, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you have to get that critical mass of centralized people on the social network in order to then scatter it out because if it's all scattered from the beginning then there's no like harnessed core of energy um mm -hmm. and you know it, it it can it it you can approach the problem from the other way and i think like projects like zero net are trying to do it from the complete other angle just start from decentralized and grow from there and eventually all the decentralized nodes connect as opposed to going from the core and then out they're thinking like it's sort of it, it can work both ways but i think it's harder in today's world to make it work from that angle as opposed to starting with the central community so do you think the the totally distributed model also has a greater just way more difficulty funding funding itself, continuing the financial sustainability? Well, the, the cool thing about, about it is that it doesn't require funding in the same way that centralized architectures do because each machine is actually powering the network. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to pay massive, or you don't need to have massive data centers because the network is the data center. Yeah. Uh, so, but those, all of those projects are just very sort of still immature. Yeah. And so it's okay to approach things, I think, from a centralization perspective and a decentralization perspective, and they're sort of eventually going to come together. Mm -hmm. Is there any performance sacrifice if you go in the peer route or no difference? Yes. Usually, uh, until, until it gets huge... I think that there probably is a little bit of a sacrifice because there are federated social networks out there now. Actually, one of the tools that we originally used was called ELG, um, which there are there are federated ELG networks out there. We ripped out MySQL from ELG and put in Cassandra, and then re you know made made it all much more object oriented code and put Angular on the front end. So we basically rewrote the whole thing. But what you happened built off Elg? Yeah, ELGG. It's, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a much older project, but we, in one of their, uh, one of their founders is a, is a good advisor with us. Yeah. But anyway, they, when you're using those federated networks, you, you definitely run into issues. Well, I actually sort of got confused. The Elg isn't so much a totally decentralized mesh network, but they did have. With federation, like if one person, if you want to follow somebody on a node that is not your the node that you're sitting on in terms of the server, things can get a little bit messy with, especially social networks. To like, if you're responding to each other and people on the central node who are following that thread are not all subscribed to the user on the other node, then the ability to see all of the responses in the threads mm. can get a little bit messy um but that that's a, an example of sacrificing convenience uh -huh. for for the greater system yeah. um there was one crazy thing a case of sacrificing convenience for or uh sacrificing freedom for convenience on facebook recently don't share links on facebook because or in private messages. If you share a link in a private message on Facebook, anyone can access it. So there's this hacker who just basically proved, and Facebook responded saying, oh, that's not a bug. That's how it's supposed to be. Mm. 
So any link that you share in a private message to Facebook is essentially publicly available, um, which is just absurd. I, I, publicly I available to that. hackers, or is that is there actually an interface in that within Facebook that you can access that? Oh no, not within Facebook. Oh, hackers, I, a hacker could potentially build a. Uh, interface to, to search that stuff if they wanted to, I think, which would be really weird, uh, and they probably wouldn't want to do that, but it's, uh, right. you know, Facebook messages messages are not encrypted. On mine's all the messages are encrypted, so your private chats, we don't even have access to that data. It's, uh, you have to do a secondary password layer in order to access your chats, and we did that on purpose because we don't even want to be able to read them or analyze the language or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but it, it's, it's open so and not encrypted, so that's what allows you to have that sort of richer media experience of like you know checking out a thumbnail from a, a news article link or watching a video in your messages. Those are things that are much more difficult to support with encrypted messenger. So, you know, but the sad part is a lot of people will exchange uh, freedom for convenience. Um, and it's another case of the encryption world having to catch up in order to be able to deliver the competitive features um, with encryption behind the non-encrypted world, which is sort of ahead in terms of usability, but behind in terms of privacy. So it's similar to that whole catch up with open source and proprietary. Mm -hmm. Is that happening? That's happening, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that's a whole other element that's really important. Is open source is one thing, and then encryption is a whole other layer that is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. It would be great. We got we got to get, uh, I think you guys have HTTPS. On, we definitely have to get HTTPS going on uh, Open Building Institute and Open Source Ecology. Uh, uh, tell me... Uh, Tell me more about that. What so HTTPS versus HTTP? Yeah, it's just a it's a secure, secure. SSL certificate, and it just allows it, it. It makes it safer for both the people who are uh, browsing your site and for the website itself to you know for so that there won't be uh, attacks. Uh huh. And it's like you just buy an SSL certificate. I think you can even get them for free. So we can we can set that up. In oh wait, we're we're HTTP months. right now, right? Huh. Okay. When is that an issue? Did, are we susceptible to that? Are we likely to get hacked? Um, you're not <laughs> likely to get hacked, but there's a big movement. Um, well, if you go to letsencrypt.org, um, they are a huge organization backed by like Mozilla and Electronic Frontier Foundation and, and places like that to give away free SSL certificates and get as many websites on the internet on HTTPS as possible. Uh -huh. So we can, we can totally set this up. What's, what's it take? Is something, make a little change on your server? Or? Yeah, it shouldn't be an issue. It's, I mean, as long, you guys are on WordPress, so WordPress is, is pretty friendly to it, and it, it shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So, uh, do you also know? Um, there's another Ted fellow who works on. There's of course Steve Segoyan, you know, him? or no, Chris, sorry, Christopher Segoyan. Sorry, Christopher Segoyan. He's a privacy advocate. There's another guy who works. Yeah, who's also like these types about who work on uh, this space. Okay, I was wondering if you knew any of those guys. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, in terms of hardware, it's also really important to, um, well, for computer hardware especially, you know, the security is directly related to the mm -hmm. hardware being open source because, um, you know, you can... Yeah. The way I... The, it's actually almost more important in that sense. Right. Uh, yeah, because the way I say it, like, anything that's not open source is malware because you don't know what's there. You don't know what's doing to you, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's funny the whole distinction between you have open source, which I think is the most strategic term for the greater movement. I've sort of come to that realization, but 
Then you have all kind of the free software people and hardcore copy left uh-huh. side. So because the free software license, actually the license of Minds is AGPL version three. Um, so that is the, the copy copyright ver- the copy left version of the general public license, which says that do anything you want with this code, um, but you have to share your changes back with the community. Mm-hmm. But then you have open source licenses like Apache, which are good licenses, but they don't require you to share back your changes with the world. And so it's um, I think that there's certainly a place for both types of licenses, but there's also that battle uh, between you know the language that we're using, like Richard Stallman, who's you know one of the co-founders of GNU Linux and the Free Software Foundation. He wrote the GPL license. Uh, you know, he's on the extreme of saying, uh, you know, free is in freedom, open source. He doesn't even actually want to associate with the open source movement, right? Because he thinks open source is taking away the freedom and political aspect from the movement in general. Right. Um, but then, you know, the Linux and like Linus Torvalds and all those people think that people should more be able to do whatever they want, including make it proprietary. So, uh, yeah, have you, have you dug that rabbit hole yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so had a little, yeah, like with Stallman didn't have direct run-ins, but yeah, no, I, I know the situation there. And we say we, we love the guy, but also, yeah, he is on the radical front. Um, yeah, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's just funny how stubborn he is with the language. Even though, I mean, because open source is just, it's, I think, the clearest language that we have to go to a mass audience. Um, yeah. But and he's, he sticks with Libre or free software. Um, but, you know, that can sort of get misconstrued, like free is in price, mon- what are you talking about, money, open source, this, the whole idea of source code, and um, I, it's, it just seems easier to communicate. So I think it kind of wins. <laughs> yeah. And then what's your opinion on all these other guys that are trying to reinvent the, the open source, like the peer production license and all that? Oh, right. I mean, that's, yeah, that's on the other end. You'll have people, yeah, I don't think that's cool. I, I, I mean, I don't think that you can reinvent open source. If, if There's people who just call their products open, which, you know, that is, maybe they can get away with that because I guess they're open in certain senses, <laughs> but doesn't mean I think anything. that unless you're, allowed, are you talking about people who just show their source code but don't allow you to do anything with it? No, I'm talking about like the peer-to-peer foundation, which is proposing this peer production license, which is not open source according to the open source hardware definition or OSI definition. And I think it's a lot of that is, I feel is confusing a lot of the new generation. I think this story here is about keeping that open source to me is about showing that kind of uh, hope or aspiration about what happens when we truly share. Okay, like take some of the oldest lessons you should share right the deepest way to share in the economic sense I believe is open source so the other guys who don't who say oh yeah you can publish that but commercial derivatives are not allowed that's not sharing you know and so so I'm disappointed at some of these people that are in the forefront of public consciousness as the leaders of the next economy yet they do not endorse open source you know so the peer production license says that it, it's basically a non-commercial open source, kind of like Creative Commons non-commercial. Yeah, essentially that's the way I understand it. I'm not sure about the details because I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that is. But last time I checked, it was, it was that. Mm-hmm. No, I I agree with you. I also think that the more licenses that come out in this space, the better. As long so as they're compatible. As, Hopefully they'd be compatible. Well, I mean, uh, the challenge with too many licenses is if you try to use, if they're not compatible and you can't use somebody else's work, you know. True. So yeah, that's I mean, the that whole issue. non-commercial. Sorry, John, yeah, I mean, like non-commercial is just simply not compatible with the way we work. We, we publish distributive enterprise. That's our goal. 
we publish ways that people can get right right livelihood based on open source so if you say oh but you can't make money with that well we can't do anything with that i think they need to get their own name for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's just, it, it's not a bad thing like it's better than totally proprietary so if I had to choose between a company doing what a peer production versus totally proprietary, I mean, obviously, it's a step in the right direction, and it could help migrate corporations from those models to have that kind of intermediary step. Yeah. But I don't think that they should be calling it open source. It, 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 so that's why they're calling it peer production. Are they trying to call it open source? Well, I mean, what we've noticed is when somebody says these days, the answer is you don't know because that word has been diluted so much that people no longer know um, a lot of people right. are simply just not educated they, they don't know what open source means typically that that argument there goes there's creative commons and which also includes nc and a lot of times people go about saying that the nc nc work they they call themselves open source so it's kind of like not paying attention to the details, but it's really confusing to the to the rest of the world because when when you say open source right now, there's no unanimous unanimous uh, reception of that as oh that means you can actually make money on it. Right. You know? In fact, a lot of people think that oh you can't make money with it because it's open source. That's and that's, that's a big problem. Yeah. That's the that, issue. That's why most companies don't do it because there's this myth that they think they can't make money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So all this yeah, all this confusion out there, uh, people don't simply don't know the history. This the history of open source has been determined in the '90s. Um, my wife, so Katarina, she wrote a thesis on open source hardware. She talks about this too. Um, for all those people that don't know this stuff, RTFM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it just to call it open source without you can't defend and say that it's open if you are restricting something so obvious that would be a requirement and wish of the person adopting whatever technology. I mean, yeah. you have to disclaim the language, otherwise, yeah, it's sort of interfering. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's diluting. Debate, right? Yeah, no, I mean, open source is a powerful brand. Unfortunately, it's been way diluted by you know, all these people that don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hadn't. Is that new? Is that what? When did it come out? Uh, no, sorry, sorry, which? When did what? I guess it's, I guess oh, that's it's, um. No, that's been that's been around. That's it's been around. Yeah, it's been around. It's, yeah, the whole not commercial debate has been going on yeah. for a while. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, it's. I think it's you got to pick your battles. You know, I think it's better to just keep pushing forward and oh, yeah. build the solution as, as opposed to fighting well, those stupid debates. Yeah. I mean, no, it's. Gonna, yeah, yeah. My policy on it is that I, I tend to, when somebody's not open source, I mean, I, I don't, there's plenty of information out there on our website or everywhere to educate people, so I don't go into arguments trying to convince somebody that's open source. But the thing that's missing still is the clear, unanimous case that open source hardware, because software that's been done, we, we got it, we, we know some of the biggest, uh, the core of the internet is open source. But right. for open hardware, the case is yet to be made that is that it's unambig unambiguously hands down a better way to develop and that's that's what we're working on so so having some track record of viral replication of some of the physical products that's what it's going to take to shift the global consciousness now what did you think of elon musk trying to say that his battery was open source well of course that's that's another case that it's fake <laughs> Uh, as in show me the source code or whatever yeah that's I mean I think the intentions there are good but I, I don't think uh, rigorous I guess when when that's said a lot of people think of that as everyone talks about that that's so so it's like whenever I hear that I'm like well it's not really open source you don't he didn't give out the blueprints for his electric car or this or that they're not right. available right so um, I think that yeah he 
it's good that Tesla's around, and it's, yeah, it's overall, I think, a good thing, but it's, you have to wonder whether it's Elon Musk or the Google execs, you know, they're, it's so intentional, the way that they're playing this, and this, this conversation isn't happening at every major tech conference, because this should, re- this is like the most important issue that really needs to be driven at every major tech conference. It's, it's the most key component into the very transparency and future of these corporations and the role they're going to play in society. And I mean, Tesla doing what they're doing is essentially opening up a pathway for open source ecology, open building institute to take over that space. Mm-hmm. Because to to create a truly open source battery power wall, uh, you know, solar setup, that whole like triage that they or uh, you know setup they have between the solar and the power wall and the car. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a beautiful design, but the, they've just left out the most important core component to making it like truly the future of the of the planet. Mm-hmm. Or do you think that they're gonna they're gonna get mass adoption just doing what they're doing? Yeah. As far as what I've heard about the car itself, the electric car that it's open source, it's it's uh, basically the way you access it is by negotiating with them. They they're inviting other companies to do that. They're not publishing like here it is, so it's not open source in that sense. Uh, as far as the details of what they're doing right now, I'm not so familiar with that, but. The thing I do agree on is that the central discussion of the universe, which is where is the economy going, like can we actually share and collaborate, that's absolutely missing. Um, And that's a discussion that should be had everywhere about the future of the economy as in open source being the default that the economy is going to, which is, of course, my conviction, what what I'm acting on. Um, That's that's clearly missing. And... uh, it will take some time for culture to evolve to that, I think. I think it's literally a matter of evolution. Just like we've gone through several realms of human rights, like first we got rid of slavery, or then we got women's you know, women's rights, things like that, or gay rights. I think open source is one of those things that are still a common, but it's not even... Uh, uh, not, not being discussed too much. It's like, I, I call it open source ethics like if you talk about ethics uh open source to me is the most elite ethic um if you talk about sharing or or kind of like the political uh, political outcomes of ethics i think open source is out there but i don't know if anybody in ethics if that's reached the field of ethics yet as open source is a critical component of what we call ethics yeah yeah it really is uh it comes down to being an understanding of the way that the universe actually works in terms of information exchange and evolution, like biological evolution almost, because, you know, when, when you're stuck in the old mindset that, you know, you own your ideas and that, you know, like you can sue somebody for doing something similar. I mean, that is just so, uh, so far away from it seems the way that the universe is really wired right no i I agree with you completely on that in the sense that for somebody for the mere existence of patents i mean it's it's kind of ridiculous if you look at uh biological design simply because anyone puts a little you know puts a little bit on top of the vast amount of human knowledge and for anybody to claim that they invented something to me is is arrogance uh, I don't really like the word inventor. I like the word innovator. But invention, it's like you did not breathe life into that, which is what that word means. It was already there. You you uncovered it or innovated on that. So I think there's a bunch of human hubris that's surrounding the way things work today. But that's a big cultural shift, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way, though, that we're seeing how fast trends can go viral now yeah yeah i i mean it's really things aren't gonna be taking as long as they have mm-hmm. for the last 10 years right we can, we're gonna start to see 
major consciousness shifts within days. Yeah. Based on based on leaks, based on media events. It's I mean Yeah. There's so much that is just probably already scheduled to get dropped in terms of major information uh, releases that just change the consciousness of the planet. Oh yeah. Do you know anything in particular? <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, we can go. We, we, I let's be surprised. Not in public. All right. <laughs> no, that sounds good. Yeah. No, that's good. As you see, we may have some cultural alignment in what the things about the things we're talking about. In that, we're both convinced that open source is the way of the future. Which is, uh, I was really glad to hear how how you think that's pretty much the default that we're well, look, trending I mean, to. Have you? Is is there anyone who is respected who is Arguing the other side that is, has any point whatsoever. I mean, how I don't really know of anyone who's like pushing patents and proprietary information. Well, I guess the only one that I would say is governments and how they're treating classified information, because that is central to you know in terms of the patents and the technology that whatever governments have that they're not sharing with us in regards to energy technology. There are there's a whole history of suppressed patents that we that we know about. Um, I don't you know it's speculative in terms of if there's some uh, super advanced energy propulsion systems that are intentionally being withheld from the public for the, the point of national security. Um, but you know I'll say it. I mean look at Hillary on her campaign trail talking up UFOs. Um, she and John Podesta, her chief of staff, are 100% dead serious disclosure of classified information related to that phenomena. I mean, they're for real about it. They're not joking. It's no longer a joke. So, and, and, and we know that there's just, but it's, it's not about whether or not those are ETs. It's about is there a super advanced form of technology that people are seeing? Could it be government craft? Yes. It's most likely government craft, to be honest. But there's definitely something going on. And how that relates to the global energy infrastructure mm -hmm. and yeah. economic system is everything. Because there, if, if technology like that gets out, the whole energy economy instantly goes out the window and yeah. things change. But, you know, check this out. I mean, the other argument of that is the moment people wake up to solar energy, the whole dynamic changes too because there's 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun than we use today. So just as simple as recognizing that and saying, hey, we're just going to switch to all solar. We've got plenty of it. Uh, all solar either... is all we need. We don't even need all that secret no. stuff to get released in order to right. transform. Right, right. So it's That's... So it's... It's really about the hearts and minds. It's about changing consciousness to for people simply to see that there are other possibilities, and that's the interesting game. It's uh, marketing the other way. <laughs> it is. What do yeah. you feel like are the uh, what what are, what's the solar panel solution that OBI and OSC are well, recommending is like the best thing well, for just the regular person? Well, I mean, right now you can you can immediately purchase yourself off-shelf solar panels that are ridiculously low cost. I mean, the prices right now are below fifty cents per watt, which means essentially like two or three year payback times if you design a low cost system using that. So that in itself, right there, is is plenty good. Are and we I, selling them through the uh, through the site? We no, we're not. We're oh, we're buying guys, them, yeah, yeah. but. Um, the goal is, I mean, so silicon is abundant. If you talk about crystalline sil or silicon solar cells, it's one of the most abundant elements on the Earth, in the Earth's crust. So silicon, I think, was is that number the number one element, I think. Um, so there's no sh no shortage, and the prices are dropping like crazy. It's even like five to ten years ago, I think five years ago it was it was ten times higher for the price of PV. So it's it's like human consciousness is, is barely able to keep up with, with that drastic decrease in cost, which is just amazing. Right. So, we're, so we're doing that on our houses. So, you know, it's just using what's already there. And, of are course, in the future... partnerships it, with, like, big solar distributors that it would make sense to 
form like affiliate relationships with to try to to try to push, push more increased revenue yeah. yeah possible yeah yeah i mean a lot of times when people ask about the the affiliate things i i'm always the radical one saying well no we're just going to build that in the future so we don't need to but it might be strategic to do some of those things i was thinking about um the survival podcast jack spierko he does an affiliate thing where his members actually his show he's a, he's a permaculture guy or survivalist guy he's got a huge following but he funds that by sponsorships from affiliates which is interesting it's like okay the members don't pay anything but sponsorships do that that could be something interesting we just haven't really explored that for pretty much for being stuck on a way of being so pure about that uh, there, right. there probably could be some good things especially if that if those sponsorships are coming from the up and coming open source enterprises that are out there that would be ideal you know? yeah that's the deal like for example the largest fastest growing 3d printer company is an open source company little bot so there's good examples of that happening Wait. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, in the next couple months, do you guys do a podcast? Well, that's okay. That's on my plate as a thing to start and get really serious about. I was actually strategizing on how to do that. But yeah, I'd love to, to collab on that. That'd okay. Be fun. I think oh, that'll be. Great combos, yeah. Okay. Um, how would you see? How would you see? Because I was, I mean, basically, like what what the Kickstarter showed me was that um, I kind of neglected my my followership in a sense that I did not have those tens of thousands of people to support the Kickstarter at the very beginning, though I, I could have that, but I just wasn't wasn't really diligent about keeping up my email lists or, or the supporter networks and all that. So I really got to do it. As we move into the next economy, we're going to need everybody's help. So part of that is starting a serious podcast where we talk about all this stuff, the distributive enterprise, peak performance, open source economics, open source product development, and all of that, and get people who are really uh, serious about that especially from the standpoint of creating the economics how do we bring everybody along you know we can do this stuff here but we got to start teaching people and we got to start getting their livelihoods happening because that's the metric of our success basically how many people we whisk out of the current economy into a new system so so shift in livelihood for people yeah absolutely yeah that, that's one of our biggest focuses that's when i got are um, you um so what's your thought on a podcast are you are you do you run one or are you on what on a podcast. I mean, are you running one or? I do them. I, my echo is so bad. So uh, I do them very frequently, but I and we're probably going to start one for mine. But I'd love to, you know, help start one with OSE and OBI. That'd be fun. Um, that would be great. Um, so help yeah. us. I mean, strategize on um, on a, basically the strategy for getting that off of the ground. Yeah, I think that it's really a lot more casual than. Too. I yeah. Mean, you can even we can hop on a live hangout like this on YouTube. Exactly. And people will just start coming in, and we just keep talking. <laughs> exactly. And I was th thinking about Mumble. You know, Mumble, the open source uh, teleconferencing. I think I've heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that. So first of all, start with something like that. Maybe install that. I was thinking. So we get off the Google thing. But right. exactly like this talking pe to people like you and all the people in the open source world that are already doing stuff that's extremely compelling and provides all this excellent food for thought and all that so that's exactly it and, and get those people roped into the project into collaborating in other ways so that's exactly that that's kind of like low-hanging fruit keep building our social capital and so forth yeah mm -hmm. and, and I think the long-form conversations are really powerful um you know you're seeing tons of new podcasts like uh joe rogan experience yeah it's like three hours long and he brings on all of these diverse interesting guests and mm -hmm. it, it, and they just you know will talk they talk shit for an hour and then they'll talk about serious issues for an hour i mean like maybe for the open source one you like me have more of a focus but I think it's also really important to have that casual friendly kind of goofy atmosphere in order to just yeah get everyone relaxed because everything doesn't have to be so like uptight and anxious all the time yeah yeah, yeah. no I like that definitely Jonathan what are your thoughts there yeah absolutely I think there are a lot of people out there that uh, have a lot of time and even too there's a busy lifestyle people want to be able to break away from their regular you know being alienated from what they want 
do at other jobs. So, you know, in, in the meantime, when people are transitioning, uh, they've got to start somewhere, and that's where they're at, in the car, to the job, wherever they work, and being able to get this in their mind, you know, where you can feed your body, you have to feed your mind. So I think that people that want to even change their whole lifestyle in terms of their diet or anything, they first have to change what they've been thinking about. So uh, yeah. being able to have more channels and mediums of communication are an excellent way for people to disengage and, and also to go back to it and refer back to it because sometimes you get distractions you gotta, you gotta cut it off and you gotta go back to it so uh, being able to put this out there so that people can listen at any point in time uh, has been the most efficient way that we've been able to, to get you know get more supporters as well as even to uh, connect other people together so yeah. with the whole concept of the social network aspect of it that's huge because you actually contain a lot of the social capital and at least a lot of the embodied energy going into what we're trying to accomplish with hardware technology. Uh, mm-hmm. I see that systemic. And so if we can bring open source on a systematic level, I think that's when we can see a lot of uh, good energy, so to speak, but to use. There's yeah. a lot of uh, diverted uh, diversions towards things that have no relevance to, to people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our, our big focus, you know, whole idea of jobs and you know, so many people being miserable in the job that they have is that's one of our central focuses is helping people monetize their presence online and, and be able to make money in just a variety of different ways from being successful and creating uh, popular content to selling products to, um, you know, even whatever it is, whatever site creates the most economic incentive for people to be there, that is the ultimate network that is going to win. Because, you know, the top social network, I mean, Facebook and Twitter literally don't give you any way to make money. I mean, YouTube is barely doing it. They let creators put ads on their videos. But that's actually a good thing. I think that's one of the, the good things that YouTube does because some of the best creators on YouTube are able to support themselves and do that for a living. I mean, it's it, Google should be paying them more, but, you know, in order to get more people out of the matrix and sort of able to participate in, in projects like this, it really takes uh, a lot of creativity and, you know, you guys have done an amazing job crowdfunding and really found a pulse that that allows you to work on, on this, but, you know, for all the people out there, it's really tough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, just to interject, I mean, in terms of, like, uh, the whole the social network aspect, I think it's really powerful because what I've noticed in my own personal life and community is that, you know, I equate it to like this. You're trying to learn about gardening, and, and you go to this gardening club, and everyone's talking about baseball, you know, and, and the only gardening you're talking about is the grass that you're growing for the, for the baseball teams, and no one's talking about anything that's relevant. So I, I see, like, this polarization of conversation only because of their minds have been so fragmented, like you mentioned earlier, this fragmentation of the great example of how you have conversation being so fragmented, so you really never have a coherent sentence, much less a conversation for people. So uh, I find that in terms of just being people, learning how to work together. So that's, you know, one of the things I think that for us as, you know, collaborators, I think that's going to be huge because people are actually going to be able to go to a gardening club and talk about gardening. And and that's an amazing thing. You know, you go to Facebook, you're not talking, you're, you're having to sift through the things that really matter to you. And uh, I would love to have my family, you know, connect with my family on Facebook, but I, I you know, the, the, the privacy issues of where's my data going. So I, I see a great potential uh, for not only just a personal use, but also to for open source ecology and OBI in the aspect of people are actually in different sec- parts of the country in the world can start an OSC or an OBI chapter to be able to, to get together. And that's one of the challenges we, we've been facing is finding collaborators and hardware developers and people that have certain interests. Uh, and the first place they need to start, well, what is the solution? Oh, start a meetup group, start a Facebook group. So this is very exciting to see uh, the, the model that, that's coming forth out of this because it's much needed. Yep. Yeah, it's it's really hard to, or you know, because we even we are tempted right now. We're on Google Hangouts, you know, to use these these tools that we don't necessarily want to be using, but we're just the efficiency is so good. <laughs> we just we give in, 
Um, so it'll be a great experience, you know, working on this together. And it's just a process of us replacing these with the open source ones. There are open source video conference tools that we're playing with, and, and that is definitely a priority, along with live streaming and, you know, podcasting. We're, we're about to put out a bunch of uh, tasks and issues that we want the open source community to help us with. And there's a really cool site called Bounty Source, which yeah. allows you... Have, have you heard of that? I've heard of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can sort of put up bounties for different features on your code base, and there's a whole community of developers there who can, you know, get paid if they do that project. So, you know, with our crowdfunding, the, you know, we're thinking about if we can fuse that with Bounty Source, then, you know, there's really no... You could see if you got, like, We've got a handful of developers on our team, all who are super brilliant and, and working really hard. But if we had a number of software developers of even a, a, a mid-sized tech company, even like 20 to 50 developers, I mean, the, the speed at which the software would evolve would be so fast that it would be, it would be completely unbelievable. I mean, we could achieve... Yeah like Facebook and Google within, you know, a matter of months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're already pretty close in, in certain senses, but they're way far ahead in other senses. So, um, you know, it's exciting in, in that sense that if, if we can just keep networking, keep bringing together the people, the, the developers yeah. who are interested in this kind of thing, I think we're going to reach a moment where things just start moving yeah. very, very fast. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's the promise of this open source hardware thing that's no one really shown you know, RepRap say is RepRap, the open source 3D printer, is perhaps the best example. But that I mean that's years of work and thousands of people kind of like moving in random directions. But I don't think anyone has really shown the true power of open source in the sense of a very directed focus effort where you just borrow a little bit of energy from a good number of people and things just explode. It's not even we call it collaborative literacy. People don't even know that that's possible. And the hardest part is the operational one. How do you actually do that? What is that process by which that happens? So that's the nut we're trying to crack. It's a very exciting one. One of the recent um, latest developments on our thinking about that was using crowdfunded, crowd design platforms such as Hero X. Do you know about that one? Hero X. No, I Hero X dot com. Okay. Um, so, incentive competition. That's by Peter Diamandis. Those people from Singularity University. Uh, but yeah, crowdfund the reward and then do a crowd challenge. That's a great idea. I think that can work. So, so we're, we're planning have, on doing oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Have you, are, are you considering doing something on here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first challenge, we might work with Hero X, but probably it's something where we might want to develop something more custom for ourselves that's branded open source. Because Hero X is not branded open source. Why not? Why don't they do that? <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you can do whatever whatever stuff there, but I think having a clear identity that that's what we do and we're open source and, and that's why you should support this because everyone benefits, that I think could drive intense amounts of traffic, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have to be epic. you got to be doing epic stuff. And right. just go all out for it and spend the time preparing that and then let the crowds do it. Sounds great. Yeah. Hey, uh, I got I to gotta hop and get some food, guys. But this Sounds is really good. awesome. Yeah, this is great. So thanks thanks for talking. So, yeah, we'll see. Um, we'll look forward to what the first instance of the OBI social network looks like. Yeah, we'll keep I'll in touch. That over and then, um, yeah, I'll follow up. I have some. Uh, 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 Jonathan, are you, uh, are you on Minds yet? Yes, I am. I sure am. What's your uh, username? Uh, let's see, I think it's JK Honor. JK, how do you spell that? Uh, just, just Julia Kilo H O N O R. So I believe that should be my my uh, name. Let me make sure I'm on there. Hang on. I believe that's my username. JK yep. Honor. Yeah. All right, okay, cool. Looks like awesome. looks like you need an avatar, homie. What about you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Marcin, what about you? What, what, is, are you on there yet? The open source ecology, no, that's the only one I have, I think. Oh, you're on, you, yeah, you have the open source, yeah, okay, we got that. Yeah. If you, um, all right, great. Cool. So, yeah, I'll talk to you guys real soon. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.